My name is Victor Furman. Some call me The Voice. I've always been fascinated with human nature, spirituality, science, and the crossroads at which they meet. Join me now and we will explore these topics and so much more with fascinating guests, authors, and experts who will guide us to Destination Unlimited. Synchronicity is a concept first explained by psychiatrist and psychoanalyst Carl Jung, which holds that events are meaningful coincidences if they occur with no causal relationship, yet seem to be meaningfully related. Here's an example. You're thinking about an old friend you haven't seen or spoken with in several years. Your phone rings, and to your surprise and delight, it's the friend you were just thinking about. Some might say this was a premonition. Others might say that your thoughts reached out and motivated your friend to call. Jung would say this was a synchronicity. How may you recognize synchronicity in your life and learn to grow and expand with it? My guest this week on Destination Unlimited, Tomas Garza, knows well the importance of all meaningful events in our lives and the beauty of using them for personal growth. Tomas Garza considers it his mission to step up, teach, and share his experience. He enjoys discussing and writing about spirituality, massive personal transformation, the power of decision, and moving beyond our self-imposed limitations. He invites us to always choose creation over comfort and love instead of fear. He's the host of the new Ohm Times radio podcast, Decide to Transform. His website is TomasGarza.com, and he joins me this week to discuss synchronicity and his book, Decide, How to Replace Your Fictions with Truth, Go Big in Life, and Transform Audaciously. Please join me in welcoming to Destination Unlimited, Tomas Garza. Good evening, Tomas. Well, good evening. Thank you for having me on. It's a pleasure to be here. And first, let me say congratulations on your new Ohm Time show, and welcome to the Ohm Times broadcast family. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be joining you all, most now, definitely. Now, let's start with your personal path and how it evolved. Please explain. All right. Well, it's a long story, as I think it is for most people. And really what has happened for me um, has been a rapid acceleration in the last year, year and a half. I have had various career lives, as I like to call them, and working in, in very vastly, vastly different industries. I've done school teaching, and I've been a U.S. Peace Corps volunteer, a family mediator, and worked in the travel industry as a travel host. And I have also significantly been an active meditator for about 35 years. I began a personal meditation practice in the mid-1980s, and in about June of 2018, I had the opportunity to begin to teach meditation at a yoga studio here in Western Oregon, where, um, where my wife Cindy and I were living at the time. And uh, it was, for me, very significant. It marked a stepping up, so to speak. It was uh, as though I had to realize that I have all of this experience. It's now time to share. It is no longer okay. It's no longer possible even to keep all of this to myself. It was very much stepping up, stepping out, and beginning to teach, and that has led to a number of new experiences and new connections over the last just year and a half, and I'm 48 years old. Wonderful. Now, we have a dual theme this evening, synchronicities and your work to enable others to go beyond their self-limitations. What part did synchronicities play in your life and how it unfolded and put you on this path? Uh, well, I have experienced what people would consider synchronicities for almost my entire life. 
And sometimes they would appear in what seemed like isolated incidences, and other times they would be very, very concentrated, what people would call a, a cluster of events. And usually what happened when I was younger is that if I had a cluster of synchronicities where I would be thinking of an old friend and they would call or vice versa they were thinking of me and i just picked up the phone and called them those ty th types of things used to happen to me all the time in certain periods of my life and during those times i recognize now looking back that these were periods of tremendous personal growth of shifts not just in my own outer life, in career lives, in jobs, in school situations, in physical moves, but also internally. And they were very, very significant. So I've had those throughout my life, and especially recently. Why don't you share some of those recent synchronicities with us? Well, I'd be happy to. I have had a real cluster of synchronicities in the last six weeks. In fact, the, the month of October and the first part of November have been absolutely amazing and, and really have marked an exponential growth for me. And the clusters of synchronicities formed um, around a, a particular person, actually. And uh, this is uh, Lisa Berry, who is the host of Light on Living on Ohm Times Radio. Uh, she and I have experienced a massive cluster of synchronicities over the last six weeks. And the backdrop to that was a in August of this year, I hired Lisa as a coach to help me develop the podcast that is now Decide to Transform, which airs this week on, on Ohm Times Radio for the very first time. And as we began working together, we began to have the synchronicities happening all of the time to where one of us would uh, – start texting and the other person was texting at the exact same time we would begin to simultaneously text each other or text an email or one of us would think about calling the other person and the other would call or reach out and text or email and this got to the point where we were doing this several times a day wow what other things started happening for you what also started happening for me was I began to experience um, a lot of, of opening and people may call these whatever, whatever they will based on their own background, light experiences. I began to feel lighter. I began to feel much differently in my physical body and then in terms of emotions and, and spirituality, I began to feel much more connected and began to be able to feel more, um, even from a distance. And what's significant about all of these synchronicities is during the whole month of October, my wife Cindy and I were in Mexico. We go back and forth between the United States and Mexico, and Lisa lives in Canada. So we were not even in adjacent areas. I was in Mexico, she was in Canada, and we were having all kinds of bending and twisting of time and space and lots of synchronicities. Uh, you would certainly, certainly have to call that a cluster. Absolutely. I'll share a couple of mine uh, just before the, we started recording this interview. I had mentioned how I came to Ohm Times. Uh, my wife and I were attending a wedding in New Jersey uh, about four years ago. And uh, my wife was officiating the wedding. I was co-officiating the wedding with her. And uh, the Bucks, uh, Krista and Liani Buck, mm -hmm. who are the uh, publisher and editor and founder and owners of the Ohm Times organization, uh, were at that wedding. And we sat with them at their table. And uh, we started talking. And uh, Chris said something to the effect that, you have a radio voice. Have you ever done radio? And I said, I just actually finished doing a series of paranormal shows uh, and I'm not doing anything right now. And he said, would you like to come and do a show for us? And so consequently, <laughs> the wedding, which uh, I, I had never met the Bucks before. They were there. We got together. They asked the question. And so synchronicity uh, happened in that case. But I think my, my biggest personal synchronicity story happened when my spiritual path reopened in my late 30s. 
I was actually uh, having some issues with my back. Uh, a friend of mine said, why don't you take yoga classes? Yoga classes will be helpful with your back. Uh, I uh, got a adult education school newspaper and I saw take yoga with this woman's name. It said Judy Hamsa. And there's something about the name Hamsa that just appealed to me and attracted me. And so I signed up for uh, her class and we met and uh, she's a wonderful, wonderful teacher. We're friends to this day. And that was more than 25, 30 years ago. And uh, during the first couple of classes, she said, I love your voice. Would you be willing to facilitate the guided meditation? And I started doing that. And then we started going on a series of these retreats to a Zen monastery in upstate New York. And at one of these retreats, someone mentioned the word Reiki. Now, I'd never heard the word Reiki before, but something about it resonated with me. And two or three of us, including my, my teacher and friend Judy, said, that's something we'll look at, you know, in a while. next. Year. This was in October. We said, we'll look at it, you know, next year. Two weeks later, we were in our first Reiki class together. And Reiki became this spiritual accelerant for me. It just sort of reopened all of the old channels for me. I was very uh, attuned as a child and... Uh, Uh, And it just sort of reopened everything. And in those days, if you wanted to go into a hospital and do laying on of hands, you needed to either be ordained in a faith where laying on of hands was considered a sacrament uh, or a licensed massage therapist. And obviously, with a full-time job, I wasn't going to go away for three years to massage school. Uh, But uh, at one of these uh, evening, Friday evening, I started facilitating a group of Friday evening meditation classes. And uh, a friend of mine said, I know this woman who is currently dealing with cancer and she'd like to learn about Reiki and meditation. And would you contact her? And I said, yes. And uh, I made a phone call and uh, we met on a Sunday morning and she opened the door and she looked at me and I looked at her and literally we said, it's you. We had recognized each other, not from this lifetime, but from a previous lifetime. Yes, uh, okay. A relationship ensued and we fell in love and I was working with her and she said, you know, there's this thing called the New Seminary of New York and I think you should enroll in that (laughs) because you can go there and you get ordained and you can do the laying on of hands and and that was the premise of going and she enrolled with me and had these wonderful teachers, amazing teachers. And um, the original premise for enrolling in this school was to, uh, like I said, be ordained so that I could go and do laying out of hands in a hospital. But as uh, things would have it, much, much more was involved. Spirit had a lot more involved, a lot more plans Mm -hmm. for us to do this. Anyway, uh, we both were ordained and graduated in November of 1997. Unfortunately, her cancer had come back and she was starting to get weaker. And at the graduation ordination ceremony, I was a speaker for the class and I acknowledged and honored her and said what a courageous and wonderful woman she was. And in the audience was a student who was coming into the school and she said, where do you find a man who speaks and honors a woman in the way that this man just did? Hmm. Um, my Judy, who was my partner, passed the following January 19, 1998. I became a dean with the school for a while, and this woman kept showing up wherever I was. Uh-huh. And uh, somebody, I said to her, I said to friends, I said, who is this woman? She's, oh, that's uh, this woman. She's a new student in the school. I said, oh, what did she do? Uh, she was the editor-in-chief of Playgirl magazine. I said to myself, yeah, uh-huh. she's not interested in me. <laughs> Little did I know, but she was the one who was sitting in that audience and heard what I did honoring that partner of mine. And uh, two years later, we were in relationship, and uh, we've been married for the last 15 years and together for 20 years, and so many wonderful mm-hmm. things have happened. So here's a, a chain of synchronicities. It is, and Lisa and I can confirm the past life connection as well. It's, it's, it becomes quite obvious um, after a, a while, after so many synchronicities in tight sequence, there's there's just more to it, and uh, I, I can relate to your story quite a bit. Absolutely. My guest is Tomas Garza. He's the author of Decide to Transform, and we'll be back with more of Tomas after these words on the Ohm Times Radio Network. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity, wellness, and personal empowerment, a philanthropic organization. Their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Om Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle.
back on Destination Unlimited. My guest this evening, Tomas Garza. He's the author of Decide to Transform. And before the break, we've been talking about the concept of synchronicity. I've been blessed with many synchronicities in my life path, including meeting special teachers and mentors that I did not consciously seek out. There's an old expression, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Do you subscribe to this or do you have a different view? I subscribe to that 100%, most definitely. It has proven true in my life again and again, in my experience. So what you're saying is, is that when you were ready to make a next step in your life in terms of either spiritual or, or whatever your work situation was, advancement, someone came who helped you with that. Yes, that's very that's very true. And recently, uh, there have been a couple of situations like that. Lisa is is one of them. And I actually met her through, um, we had a, a mutual friend, a mutual contact that I had once done some coaching work with. And um, actually, this woman and I broke off our coaching relationship uh, over a year ago. I went and wrote the book decide and when i was done i remember just one casual conversation with this woman that i had back in august of 2018 where she said well when you have your book ready when it's ready to be published then let me know i know somebody who can get you on home times radio and i thought okay well that sounds good i remember taking a note about doris which was the name of, of the um, the coach that I was working with at the time, and Ohm Times Radio. And I filed that away until the book was published this summer. And then uh, I wound up reaching out and uh, got an email introduction to Lisa. And I thought, okay, well, this is really, really interesting. I'm going to pursue this. And, and she um, also works as a podcast trainer. She's the host of Light on Living and does a number of other things in, in terms of her business and entrepreneurship and was um, reached out to me right away. And what happened is we began to really connect uh, on a creative level. Uh, very, very synergistic, very synergistically is the way I would describe that. And uh, I, I was certainly ready to take that next step. And, um, and then all of a sudden, there it is when it's when the causes and conditions are ripe. In other words, when the student is ready, the teacher appears, something happens, and it could appear to be something random, as in the synchronicity. It doesn't necessarily look on the surface as though it's causally connected. What do you attribute synchronicity to? Is it something that we generate as we grow in this life, or is the source external to us? Well, it's something that we tend to generate in this life, I think, because the source is not external to us. The source actually is us. And as we grow, as we open ourselves to it, we begin to allow these experiences to happen. And we begin to be, in my experience, more attuned to a message or the messages that a synchronicity or a cluster of synchronicities may hold for us. You know, there's an old expression, nature abhors a vacuum. And I'm wondering if that applies to synchronicities too. When we create that internal vacuum, that spiritual or personal vacuum, and open up that space for something new to come in, I wonder if that's part of the synchronicity package. I think that if people are not in a place, in my experience, just speaking from my own recent experience, I, I wouldn't have noticed or paid attention to um, any of these synchronicities if I hadn't been at a certain place in my own personal and spiritual development. 
And for example, this could never have happened two years ago. And if it had, I would have either dismissed it or I wouldn't have recognized a lot of the lessons. And when it begins to happen again and again, then it just became very obvious to me that there is a, a message here. There are a series of messages here. And it also became very obvious to, to Lisa. We were going through this at exactly the same time. And um, teaching each other, really, I'm, it was started out as a coach-client relationship, but has now completely gone beyond that to the point where we're actually going to be working together and partnering in the future, which is exciting because it's very creative and a lot of fun. You talked about being ready at that point for these things to start falling into place and lining up for you. There's an old Buddhist concept of readiness in time, which basically says a certain number of events have to have taken place and converge to the point where you're ready to make that change in your life. Do you subscribe to that? Yes, I do. That that informs my experience quite a bit. Uh, if If a person is not ready, if they haven't prepared themselves, if they haven't released what they need to release, if they haven't forgiven what they need to forgive or had the experiences that they need to have, then they will not be attuned to a, a particular situation, to a particular growth situation. And, and it would simply mean to me that they're, they're not ready for it at that moment. And in time, I, I, I have a a philosophy personally that this is what time is for is to allow us to have these experiences these growth and transformation experiences so that we can become ready to take the next step when it arises and and we have to be attuned to that and it's a process I and mean, that's one thing that i most certainly want to emphasize is it's a process. And for me, it has rarely happened in fits and starts. It's been a lot of work, meditations, a lot of practice, obviously, over time. How would you teach others to prepare, go through that process, and open themselves to synchronicities? I, I would encourage people to simply pay closer attention to their experience. And of course, there are a number of techniques for people to develop their awareness, whether it's meditation or yoga or physical exercise, it could be art for somebody, whatever that looks like, there are ways that we as human beings can consciously make a decision and, and there's the, the emphasis on the action verb, decide, to, to, we can decide to pay closer attention. We can decide in favor of our own growth, in favor of our own transformation. And one of the beauties of being alive is that we have the ability, we get to make this choice every moment of every day. And it's also the question of learning to hear as well as you listen. That's true. That is most definitely true. I don't know how many people I've met that say they hear something, but are they really listening to it? Or are they really... That, that's very true. All we have to do to take a, a, a good quick look at that is observe people in conversation or and sometimes we can we can look back on conversations that we ourselves have had where the one of the people maybe ourselves maybe someone else was hearing but not really listening or as people say listening to respond rather than listening to understand in other words sort of listening to somebody but thinking about what they were going to say next instead of really hearing the other person and listening to them and, and getting a sense of what's really going on in their world. Now, you had mentioned that your path reopened, or, or I like the word reopened because I believe we've always been on the path. But when you started with your meditation practice, how important is getting into a practice of meditation to doing this type of work? For me, it has been critical, and I wouldn't be here without it. 
I, I wouldn't be here without it because at the time where when I began a meditation practice in the 1980s, I was actually in high school, and it began in high school geometry class, which is not the most likely place for somebody to pick up a practice of sitting meditation. But we had a geometry teacher that encouraged us to do it, and he actually would have us sit down and meditate in class, not every day, but often. And what I found is I really resonated with that. And it helped me, well, it helped calm me down physically and, and emotionally. And that was a tumultuous time in my own life. So what happened was I was ready for something that I could proactively, consistently and pers persistently work on on so that I didn't get swept away in the drama that was all around me. I mean, it surrounded me in my home life and in a lot of different areas. I so think, it really saved me up. I think for many of us, uh, getting into an active meditation practice has been life-changing and beneficial in so many ways. We're going to talk more about your program. My guest this week is Tomas Garza. He's the author of Decide to Transform, How to Replace Your Fictions with Truth, Go Big in Life, and Transform Audaciously. Uh, Tomas, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about you and your work. Oh, wonderful. You can get the book on ebook or paperback wherever you buy books, um, whether it's uh, Amazon or anywhere else. And there is a link to purchase the book on my website, TomasGarza.com. And spell that for our listeners, please. Yes, it's Tomas, T O M A S, Garza, G A R Z A. That's all one word, TomasGarza.com. And we'll be back with more of Tomas after these words from the OM Times Radio Network. This is OTRFM, part of the IOM Radio Network. Humanity Healing International is a small nonprofit with a big dream. Since 2007, HHI has been working tirelessly to bring help to communities with little or no hope. Our projects are not broad mandates nor are they overnight solutions, but they bring the reassurance that no one is alone and that someone cares. To learn more, please visit humanityhealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. So I'm a cat, and I just moved in with this new human, and she's got this little toy she's always playing with all day long. Tap, 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 bloop, bloop. She can't put it down. There it is. Oh, and get this. She even talks to it. Last week, she asked it for Chinese, and guess what? Egg rolls showed up like magic. Humans have cool toys. A person is the best thing to happen to a shelter pet. Be that person. Adopt. Brought to you by the Ad Council and the shelterpetproject.org. Tune in to the Practical Intuitive Mind, Body, Spirit for the Real World with me, host Robin Fritz, Mondays at 2 p.m. Pacific, 5 Eastern. I'll cover personal and business intuition animal communication, mediumship, space clearing, past life regression, shamanic insights, energy healing, soul choice, and more, all to help you tap your own intuitive and healing skills. No ifs, ands, or buts. Imagine being fired because of who you love. Imagine being denied medical treatment because of who you marry. Imagine being evicted because of who you are. Millions of Americans don't have to imagine this. They have to live it. Because in 30 states, it's legal to discriminate against LGBT people. Get the facts at beyondido.org. Brought to you by the Gill Foundation and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this evening, Tomas Garza. He's the author of Decide, How to Replace Your Fictions with Truth, Go Big in Life, and Transform Audaciously. So based upon your work, what would you say is the greatest obstacle for most people to personal growth, achievement, and happiness? That's a really excellent question. I think that the 
greatest obstacle for people is a general lack of awareness. I think it's the fact that so many people just sleepwalk through life. And I, I would know that because I spent most of my young adulthood in just such a trance, in a fog, really, absolutely, completely befogged and numb and very, very um, unaligned uh, and poorly aligned, misaligned careers. And the lack of awareness leads to our, our not having the, the wherewithal to see what we're actually doing. And we fall prey to all kinds of limitations that we've habitually placed on ourselves from what seems like time immemorial. And they take the form of limiting stories that we all tell ourselves that help us keep whatever we consider our comfort, our comfort zone, and they don't allow us to transform because they justify our continued inaction. So without awareness of some degree, then we continue to listen to a, a voice in our head, call it the ego, if you're comfortable with that description that keeps us small and that keeps us stuck. Please share some examples of these limiting stories and how they prevent growth. Okay. There are a number of these limiting stories. And some examples are stories that we tell ourselves, such as, well, this is just not for me. Sounds good, but it's just not for me. Or I'm too old. I'm too young. I'm too smart. I'm too stupid. I am not athletic enough. I'm too athletic. Or another example could be, this just not the right time for me. I'm stuck where I am, or this group has already started, and I'm way behind, so I'll just sit this one out. Those types of things that we tell ourselves, and if we're really honest with ourselves, we, on further examination, can't help but notice that we tell ourselves these stories all the time. And are these based on self-doubt, fear, or a combination of things? Mainly on fear, which, of course, manifests as all kinds of things, what, what could be uh, considered rage, anger, self-doubt, self-questioning, right? self, self-deprecation. Fear, it's all based on, on fear, and fear as the opposite of love. And we do have a choice whether we choose fear or whether we choose love. And when we fall prey to fear, it takes on any number of forms and gradations. But really, in my experience, it's all the same thing. How are these self-limiting stories ingrained in us in our childhood, or are they? They were for me. And while I can't speak for everybody, I think that most listeners would have to say, if they took a long, hard, honest look, that these things were ingrained by the, maybe their parents, maybe school teachers, maybe their friends, family members, from childhood on, and even on a societal level, we as a society ingrain and inculcate people with all kinds of beliefs, and many of them are, are not very helpful. And in my instance, it was a lot uh, from my family members who, like many families, I'm certainly not alone nor special in any way, but they had certain ways of viewing the world and they wanted all of us who were their blood relatives to conform to that viewpoint, which had, as far as I was concerned as a kid, always been in place. And didn't seem to me, it didn't seem to me much at all like people really questioned it. Would you share some of those limiting stories from your family? Yes. From my family, the limiting stories had to do with social status more than anything else. And they had to do with what one did for a living. And there were only certain things that were acceptable 
to uh, to my family and those included things such as doctor lawyer politician those types of status laden status worthy jobs in their mind were all that a member of the family could ever aspire to and hope to be a decent person that was the continued message that got driven into actually all of us from a young age very young and how did those stories affect the choices that you made they affected my choice of career in my early adulthood. For me, I attended university undergraduate. There was never any doubt that I was going to do that because happily, I always liked school and I always did my best in my studies just because I I enjoyed it, which happened to probably save my life (laughs) in a lot of ways. But because I did that, I attended university and got good grades and enjoyed my, my studies. But because of the upbringing, I felt like I was limited for career choices. And I wound up when I was 23 years old, applying to law school and attending law school in Portland, Oregon. And that doesn't may not sound, uh, some of you as listeners may be attorneys yourselves, but uh, this was not something that was very aligned with who I am as a person. And I've certainly come a very, very long way almost a 180 from that now as an author, as a podcast host in the field of spirituality and personal transformation that has very little to do with contract litigation. But I found myself in that situation. And what did you use to move past those limiting stories? Well, I went to school and I graduated from law school out of sheer stubbornness, I would have to say that I I got from my dad. And um, if he's listening to this broadcast right now, and I'm going to tell him about it, that's quite a compliment to him, because he uh, is a man that's very, very good at finishing what he starts. And I, I did that, I finished what I started, which wound up leading to a number of beneficial things. Uh, career-wise, I had opportunities open up to me that never would have happened otherwise, and I never in uh, um, I- I- at all would have met my, my wife, Cindy. Uh, I never would have met her had I quit law school, and that would have likely meant my, my leaving Oregon, and that's where I met her. So many beautiful things never would have happened had I not had that stubbornness. But uh, during during those times, it was very, very difficult because I knew I could feel in my heart, in, in my mind, a complete misalignment with my calling, with my purpose in life. And it was stifling, very, very stifling to me. And other people may enjoy and love the practice of law. I have many friends who are attorneys that are really great at what they do, but it was not for me. So what would you say to someone who's stuck with these self-limiting stories? How do they get past those? But I think the, the number one thing is we all have to recognize that we're telling ourselves a, a self-limiting story. If we don't recognize our limiting beliefs, then how are we ever going to seek to move beyond them? So there's a, a, a component of recognizing what's going on. But then once you do, that's where decision becomes so critical, because without an actual decision to transform, without a decision to make a conscious change in your life, and this applies to any area of life, by the way, it could be your physical health, it could be a job or career, it could be changing your relationship or your spiritual path, whatever that is, without a decision, People don't really go all in and they dabble. They attend yoga class. If they want to practice yoga, they attend one class a year or they buy a gym membership and attend once, maybe twice in a period of six months. So, of course, they don't derive the benefit from it without making a real conscious decision, then 
it's very difficult to achieve lasting progress. Progress may happen for a period of time, but without the decision, it's unsustainable. So we tell ourselves these limiting stories, and we want to make a decision, but how do we recognize, because it's been so easy for us to keep telling ourselves those stories, how do we recognize them and then affect the decision? What needs to happen for all of us is we need to either take a step back and take a step back and just be able to see things from a different perspective, which is one of the main benefits for me of meditation. A meditation practice has enabled me to open up some space where I'm able to examine my own life and look at things from a different perspective. Now, if somebody is unable or unwilling to do that, then sometimes the universe will throw a circumstance right up in in your face and force you to make that examination. Mm, Absolutely. My guest is Tomas Garza. He's the author of Decide, How to Replace Your Fictions with Truth, Go Big in Life, and Transform Audaciously. And we'll be back with more of Tomas after these words on the OM Times Radio Network. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free, ascendinghearts.com. Change and growth are part of natural life and also part of your spiritual life. Everyone needs support and guidance, especially during life passages. Upgrade yourself with the Ohm Times Experts program. With Ohm Times Experts, you have access to the best intuitive coaches, spiritual teachers, counselors, astrologists, and oracles. Our team was carefully selected so you can trust. Find out more at experts.ohmtimes.com. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living, a chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Hi, I'm your host, Smokey Cole Bear. Filling in for Smokey, because after 75 years of... Only you can prevent wildfires. Turns out there's much more to say. Nearly 90% of wildfires are caused by us humans being careless, dumping our used barbecue coals willy-nilly. Guess the song was wrong. We did start the fire. That's why I respect Mother Nature and her trees, whether coniferous or new car scented. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. Back on Destination Unlimited, my guest this evening, Tomas Garza. He's the author of Decide, How to Replace Your Fictions with Truth, Go Big in Life, and Transform Audaciously. What are some of the empowering statements that you have used and taught others to turn around the limiting stories? This is great. There's so many of these that that we can use. And the premise on this is something that I talk about in Decide, the book, is that we have believed these limiting stories all of our lives for, for decades in many people's cases and without even questioning those. So for every limiting story, there is at least one and sometimes more empowering statements or uh, transformative statements that we could choose to believe instead with the emphasis on choice, because it's always a choice. So if somebody is in the habit, for example, of telling themselves that they're stuck, it is very helpful to say the exact opposite, the 
I am never stuck. Or if you feel like you don't have adequate help, you might tell yourself, I have all the help I need. And you could even go bigger with this. If somebody says, hey, I can't, I can't do this, I can't do that, I just don't have the ability, then why not go much bigger and say, I'm all powerful. And mm -hmm. repeat that to yourself as often as you can. I'm all powerful certainly sounds better than I can't. How does using these positive statements change our brain function? Well, as far as the, the neuroscience to that, that is an area where I am not an expert, but I would certainly invite the curious listener to simply run a Google search of the benefits of meditation or the benefits of a gratitude practice on the brain, on the physical body. And there's a lot of compelling evidence out there. And in the book, I don't cite that because as a meditation instructor, my primary take is people simply need to experience these things for themselves. This is all about experience. And as a teacher, I don't expect that just because I'm saying something or someone else is saying something that some that a person's just going to believe that. In fact, they don't have to believe anything that I say, but I invite people to try it for themselves. And if someone is audacious and bold and courageous enough to try it and then begins to have that experience, well, then that is truly transformative. It's interesting that uh, recently in news with certain events that have been transpiring in our world, I heard someone say the other night that if you tell a lie often enough, it becomes the truth. And I'm wondering if what we're doing with your process is reversing that internally. Well, it is. It is reversing that internally because, again, the one thing that we retain happily is our power to make a conscious choice. And I understand that if someone is, is deeply depressed or if somebody is feeling very sad or frustrated or enraged, it doesn't feel like we have a choice. It doesn't feel like in the moment like we can shift a situation, but we really do retain that power. So it is a matter of reprogramming. And I, I once, when I started meditating, I had a friend who said, oh man, that's mind control. And my thought, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's right. That's right. You say that those who would choose to help others must put on their own masks first. What does this mean? Okay. I love this phrase from the airplane, as in when they're talking about the safety demonstration, we've all heard that, uh, put your own mask on first, then assist others, because if you pass out at 35,000 feet and you're traveling with your kids, then you won't be able to help them put their masks on. And this applies to the field of personal growth and transformation, because I have worked with and known so many people in my life who considered it selfish to meditate, who considered it selfish to take care of themselves, to practice yoga, to improve their physical health for all kinds of reasons. But my, my take on this is that it's selfish not to. It's selfish not to because we have to have something to give. So anyone that would step up in any kind of leadership or teaching capacity must have something to give other people. And if you are a wreck all of the time, then you have nothing to give but wreckness. You have nothing to give but stress and anxiety. Whereas if your cup is more full... And if you are relatively more calm, then you can exude calm. You can deliver calm on whatever stage. And the reality is, whether we hold ourselves out as teachers or not, we are always teaching people and people are always learning from us. And we, similarly, are always learning from everyone else because no one ever learns as much as the teacher. Absolutely. 
Um, what inspired you to write Decide? I have always been a, a writer and had never actually published a book. I wrote back in the early 2000s a couple of full-length novels and never chose to publish those for uh, various reasons. But I was inspired to do this about a year ago. My wife, Cindy, and I attended a one of her business conferences in Arizona. And Cindy is a transformational health and wellness coach. And we all in a group, there was a group of about eight or nine of us, and we all got together and talked about our audacious goals for the year ahead, things that were beyond simple monetary goals, simple productivity goals. We were encouraged at the conference to think about things that um, seemed like a stretch, that seemed like a leap for us. And it occurred to me spontaneously to publish a book. And that that's what I've done. And what I, I didn't count on at the time was also developing and launching a podcast worldwide. I had not counted on that. that that's that been an additional benefit. And then meeting a, a tremendous, tremendous energetic, creative, synergistic business partner and making that kind of partnership and deep friendship with Lisa is something that is an added benefit on top of that. And it has just generated momentum because when I made the decision to write the book, it opened up everything else. This goes back to our first part of the discussion this evening about synchronicity and that as you open to these synchronicities, one door opens, another door opens, and ultimately it leads you to where you have to be. That's very true. And sometimes many doors open at once and you find you have the ability to go through all of them at once because they're all opening at the same time for a reason. That's multi-door tasking. <laughs> It is. It's multi-door tasking, and it's going on live right now. <laughs> so you mention universal spirituality in your book, and you mention it often. Why is universal spirituality so important? All right. This is something that I could talk about for several hours, but I'll keep it short. <laughs> the, the summary is spirituality is universal, and to me, it has never made any difference difference what tradition people grew up in, what part of the world they grew up in, because we all have the same experiences in life. We have similar experiences, and we all have the same choice between love or fear. And every moment of every day, we have the ability to make that choice, and we choose one or the other. And the rest of our life continues to unfold based on that choice. And it's universal because love is abstract. It's completely beyond the building that people go to. And this has specific and, and very, very poignant meaning for me because I was raised in a very fundamentalist church environment where I absolutely did not resonate with what people were trying to instill in me. I absolutely did not resonate with anybody having an exclusive hold, a stranglehold, if you will, on the truth. Mm. It never resonated with me. Mm. Do people have to go into a deep and immersive spiritual journey to derive benefit from your program? They do not. In, in fact, any reader of the book can take whatever they want from it. Because in the book, what I go through is, of course, things that you can choose to believe instead of a limiting story. And I talk about the benefits to people of doing that, listing things that they can consciously do, little things that don't seem significant at the time, but can really help somebody generate momentum. And you do not have to go into a deep spiritual journey at all. In fact, it's a myth that you have to sell all your belongings, shave your head, and run off to the Himalayas to become a monk in order to derive benefits from something like meditation. 
But even if somebody doesn't consider themselves spiritual in any way, they can certainly derive benefit from taking a step back and recognizing where they're doing harm to themselves and thereby others. And it's about practical things that you can do every moment of every day. And that's one of the reasons that I've decided to step out and teach is I've discovered that there are so many ways for me to be able to take what seem like complex concepts and distill them into bite-sized, usable, tangible pieces for people. And yeah, uh, you don't have to run off and become a monk, nor do you have to change your own tradition. If you're in a spiritual tradition and it works for you and you feel a connection, by all means, go deeper with that. His name is Tomas Garza. He's the author of Decide, How to Replace Your Fictions with Truth, Go Big in Life, and Transform Audaciously. Tomas, one more time, please tell our listeners where they can get your book and find out more about your work. All right. The book Decide is available in paperback and ebook wherever you buy books. You can order it from bookstores. It's available on Amazon. And also, you can click the link on my website to purchase your copy, either in, in paperback or ebook. The website address is tomasgarza.com. And if you'd like to work with me further, I would also refer you to that website. I do provide people personalized teachings in the form of a voice recording, also one-on-one -on -one consultations. So again, the website address, tomasgarza.com. Tomas, I am so glad for the synchronicity that brought us together this evening. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for joining us on Destination Unlimited. I'm Victor, the voice Furman. Have a wonderful week.